Welcome Life Sciences, welcome to another exciting Life Science lesson. What are we looking at today? Well guys, we're revising human evolution. And I know it's a section that some of you really battle with, all right? but I'm going to try and make it as easy as I can. Remember, I'm just revising, so I'm going to look at the basic points, I'm going to look at the more important points, you guys have got to kind of like put the flesh, etc. onto that. Now remember, when we're looking at human evolution, there's a lot of terms and a lot of new words, and we need to make sure that we're going to be able to use them properly. So just a quick outline what we're going to look at when we look at human evolution. So guys, we're going to just look at all right, how we broke down, how did all right, this evolution, where was the speciation event, and we're looking at the characteristics, the structure, what makes us all right, human. So what was the path that we followed? What do we see? What are the differences right, between these apes and then us? What, what makes us so different? We're also going to look at um, the fossil record. Unfortunately, you need to know right, examples of the different fossils that were found when we're looking right, or grown, when we're going through human evolution. And the last thing we're going to touch on is the hypothesis, all right, or the out of Africa hypothesis. How, where did, where did Homo sapiens originate from? And where did they go from there? And as I said, guys, a lot of, a lot of big terminology, a lot of words. And remember, whenever we use, all right, a word in italics, we're always explaining it's about its scientific name. And remember, scientific name, something always has two names, the genus and the species. But let's get on to that. All right, I think a long time ago, some of you might have remembered, we did this whole thing of classification. And what classification was, if you can have a look at the board behind me, we like to put things in order. Okay, so we start off by looking at the criteria. So certain organisms, all living organisms, must fit into this box because they've got this, this, and this. And at each time, all right, we go down, we make the criteria more and more specific. So we are looking at this, when we start off with human evolution, all right, we are looking at this one, the order. And while we're looking at the order, right, we're looking at this whole concept of a primate. We fall under this order that primates. Does that make us a great ape? Does that make us, all right, a chimpanzee? Does it make us an orangutan? No, right, what does it do? We are going to have things in common. Right, that's what we're going to look at. We are going to have things in common. So all the way, all the way, all the way here, we're going to have things in common right, with certain other species. This last one at the end here, the species, that is the characteristic that makes us totally unique. So where are we going when it comes to the human evolution? We belong to the order primates, and that is the big apes, the gorillas, etc. And what happens is we're going to separate, we're going to split. Now, these are really long words, but unfortunately you need to understand a little bit of the split. What does the split mean? We belong to the primate order, okay? And what happens is we split primates, split, remember we're looking at speciation events, into two different families. Now the one we belong to, all right, as well, is the hominid, hominid. And basically that means, you can see in blue, I match them, they're all the great apes and all of us. So we fit in here with all the monkeys, the orangutans, and all of those things. But what do we notice later on? We have a separation again. This hominid group of all the monkeys, all the chimpanzees, all of the orangutans split into another group called the hominins. And what were the hominins? They 
all the living humans, that's us, Homo sapiens, and all of our extinct ancestors. And we'll have a look at that concept just now. So guys, the phylogenetic tree is so important here. So let's put a little bit of a time frame on it. And I'm going to concentrate on this time frame. Why? Round about six million years ago. This is the one that we're looking at. All right. We had this common ancestor. Can you see here? Phylogenetic tree. This is the common ancestor of all. All right of the hominids, all right, great apes, etc. But round about six million years ago, what happened? The hominins, which is us and our ancestors, we split, all right, from the so-called hominid group. And this is now, as you can see, finally going to lead us to what we are, the Homo sapiens. Okay, very, very confusing, I know. But let's have a look here. It's a lovely little phylogenetic tree. Let's answer it and see if it comes a little bit clearer. Okay, study the diagram of a phylogenetic tree. You must be able to write, um, understand phylogenetic trees in the evolution section. For primates, right, what were we? We are primates, and that is our order. Okay. And then answer the questions that follow. Okay, question number one, to what order? Right now, over here, this diagram doesn't tell us what order, but it's something that you need to know. We are in the primate order. We have things in all of these, all right? We have things in combination or in, co in common with all of these animals. What? family do modern humans belong? Now guys, read your diagram. Over here, there we go. The family is indicated and it's a homnidae, homnid, the nid at the end, all right? That is going to be, all right, the family that we belong to. I'm not going to write it over there. Homnid, so what was the homnid again? All of the great apes, all right, and the human ancestors. Next question, name two species that belong to the same family. So here we go. It's told me the family as humans. So don't use humans because they've already told you. You have then got four to choose from. The chimpanzee, the bonobo, the gorilla, or the orangutan. Right. All of those, see, they fit into the bracket that's telling us these are part of the Homday family, the great apes. Now, the next question, according to the phylogenetic tree, when did the most common ancestor for humans, yes, humans, and gorillas exist? So, guys, what we do is we take it, and where do we meet? Where do we meet? We meet at circle number C over there. And then what do we look at? We go and have a look what it says over here. All right. And it tells us millions of years ago. And that will be 10 million years ago. Instead of writing out all of that, you can do that. Okay. The question that can often be written is what is the difference between hominids and hominids, right, hominids, guys, let's go back, I'm going to go back to right at the very beginning, okay, there we go, hominid, what is a hominid? It's the group consisting of all modern and extinct grade apes, and guys, we fit into that, all right, we fit into that group, we modern humans, chimpanzees, we with them, then they asked you what is hominins. This is a hominin. They are all living humans and their extinct ancestors. That is a really important concept that you guys, all right, are going to need to undergo. Okay, why do we belong to the primates? Let's have a look. We belong to a primate because we have things in common. 
not because I'm a monkey or a great ape, I have characteristics in common with them. What do I have in common? Let's have a look over here. I have an opposable thumb. All right, I can pick up things. The eyes are in the front of my head. My arms can rotate, all right? My legs can rotate. If you have a look at their upright posture, not about walking, right? I've got nails, right? Fingertips with nails. So I'm in the primate group because I have the same characteristics. But now, that leads us to the next part. And this is the important part. Human evolution is about what makes me different. So what, when we have a look at our phylogenetic tree, what makes me, what happened that my ancestors are on that branch? That must mean that I have things different. There are things that make me different. Now, if you have a look at the skeletons behind me, you can see that they all have things in common. They have things, we look at the skeleton, right? Let's look at the skeleton. That's what you're looking at, anatomy. So if I look at what it looks like, I can see they've got things in common, but I can also see that they have things different. And the one thing that we are going to concentrate on, one of the biggest pressures, if I could talk that, like that, is this concept of bipedalism. Walking habitually. Habitually means walking all the time. A great ape can go on its fours and it can do something like that. But what is it? It's a knuckle walker. When it walks, it walks on its knuckles. What are we? All right, what are the hominins? What did we start doing? Bipedalism. And that concept, right, of walking up, up straight all of the time, right, brings about these changes that we're going to see. Okay, guys, we're going to have a quick break and we'll be right back. Welcome back, Life Sciences. I hope you had a good break. As I say to you, just get that little bit of a stretch, get the oxygen going, get the blood flowing, makes our brain so much clearer, especially for the section when it comes to human evolution. As I said, I know we all struggle a little bit, but we'll be fine. What have we looked at? We've looked at the concept of where the human part, where our ancestors came from, this common ancestor that we spoke about. And remember what we said, we, when we look at it, we belong to a group, this order of primates. And the reason we belong there is because we have things in common. Now, each time we go along the classification, right, the criteria gets more and more, right, you need to be more specific. It needs to get more precise. And that starts to exclude a lot more individuals. So at the end, we looked at this concept of bipedalism. So what do you think one of the driving forces was of the split around about six million years ago was that organisms, I'm going to use them organisms, but our living ancestors right, walked habitually on two legs. And that is very evident when we look at the anatomy. How did the skeleton change, right? And with that anatomy, we link a lot of other things. What tools do we see? What kind of cultures did they have, right? So this development of this bipedalism brought about this whole range of differences that we're going to look at. Okay, as I said to you, look at all the words again, or I can be a little bit confusing. So guys, when we look at right, this whole human evolution from ape-like structures to the what we're homo sapiens today, 
we rely on three sets of evidence. Now, the first set of evidence is fossil evidence. And you would have looked at the concept earlier, all right, maybe earlier years of school, of what a fossil is. A fossil is a, an organism usually that had bones or something hard, and it's basically left like a picture behind. I think a lot, for a lot of us, this is the one piece of evidence we can cling to because we can see it. All right, guys, cultural evidence. Now, what does that mean? We actually, through a time, tool making. What do we mean by tools? Hunting, right, cutting food, etc. And we're going to notice certain trends there. All right, so with the skeletons, what did we see with them? Did they have certain to tools? Did they maybe live in a cave where they painted? Did they have some kind of ritual how they bury the young? And that gives us this whole route that we're on. And then the last bit of evidence that we look at, and this is pretty much when we look at the out of Africa, is genetic evidence. How simile, similar are we genetically? And here, right, when it comes to human evolution, we rely a lot on mitochondrial DNA, right? Remember, the DNA is found, deoxyribose nucleic acid is found in the nucleus, but the mitochondria in itself had its own little ring of DNA called the mitochondrial DNA. And that DNA, when you looked at sexual reproduction, that DNA is in the, when the sperm and the egg fuse, oh, the man falls away. And we have this picture of this, the female DNA. So we kind of get an idea of history that is pretty much unchanged throughout time. And that can lead us to this plan of, right, where did, where did humans come from? Where were they found? All right, those concepts that are quite important. Guys, when it comes to the human all right, evolution and the fossils, the skeleton is a really important part here. Now, the skeleton you would have done, maybe in earlier years, as part of your syllabus, but it's really important that you understand, and I'm going to say it here, the trends. Right, what do I mean by trends? Okay, guys, let's start. Let's take, for example, all right, this whole structure is the skull. This structure is the cranium. So it's really important that you understand what the skeleton is. So we start off with primates. Those, let's start off with gorillas or monkeys all right, or apes. They've got a very small cranium. All right. And what did we notice over time, the trend? Have a look here. Look at the cranium. What does it start to do? It starts to get bigger. So the trend is, right, what are we starting to see? A bigger cranium, right, not a bigger skull necessarily, so the words are important. And with that bigger cranium, what comes a bigger brain? Intelligence. What does intelligence allow us to do? Make better tools, draw, speak, keep fire going, if I can keep fire going, I can keep warm. If I can keep warm, I can go into areas where it's colder. If I've got a fire, maybe I can eat different kinds of food, maybe proteins. What do proteins do? Make me stronger. If I'm stronger, what can I do? I can go search for food. So it's this whole concept of the brain, all right, the evidence, not so much the brain, this cranial capacity leading us to this whole concept of intelligence, cultural evidence, tools, burials, etc. What else do we see? Remember, with bipedalism, when I walk upright, my whole skeleton has a slight tweak to it. Right. Guys, I must be honest with you, walking on two feet, it's not like, wow, the most amazing thing ever. Why? We get back pain. It's sore. But what did it allow us to do? Hunt. Carry our babies. All right. Search for things. Okay. That was the things that we were able to see when we did it. So when we're looking at this concept of trends, you guys, 
as I said, this is a revision, so I don't want to get too much detail. You need to look at the skeleton. How did the brain, cranium change, teeth, jaw, my arms shorter because I don't need to swing, right? My legs longer. What happened to my toes? I wish, I'd love to be able to grab with my toes. I can't even pick up a towel, right? What happened to our feet? It all changed, right? Slight changes to make walking better. It was a natural, as far as natural selection goes, it was a favored characteristic. Guys, very often when we get to um, questions on these, you need to be able to distinguish between, all right, so like apes are on one side, humans are the other, and we look at that whole fossil record, in between is the Australopithecans. okay, like this kind of like in between the two groups. Let's have a look at a typical question. So it tells me here, the diagrams show, all right, the skulls of two species of primates. So here, you are totally reliant on what the structures are. Okay, the first question. Tabulate three observable differences between skull one and skull two that show trends in evolution. This could be quite a tricky one. Okay, so the first thing is tabulate. So what am I gonna do? I'm going to draw a table. I don't know how picky they are about a heading, but if you want to, you can put your heading in. So I'm going to say skull one, and I'm going to say skull two. Now they want to know the trend. Okay, so skull one has a small cranium. You can't say brain, guys. It's not about the brain. You can't, it's a skull. What do we see in skull two? Crani the trend, trend, cranium becomes much larger. There we go, about the trend. Let's have a look over here. Let's go for the obvious. Large jaw. Right, so what over here, what do we notice? The jaw becomes much less prominent. Do you notice the words we use? All right, prominent, smaller. It's quite a few that we can go there. All right, what's the next one we're going to do? A lot of you don't like this one because, all right, you have to spell it, and that's a prognathus or a brow ridge. I'm going to go with nice, obvious ones. Okay, large teeth. And again here, the trend, it is, even if it's the same thing, teeth become smaller. All right, there's a few more that we can do. All right, another one we can concentrate on here is about the bridge, brow ridge. Okay, so it's quite a few. They're not asking you to compare the differences. Observable. You must see them, all right? And they want to know the trends in evolution. Our time is running out, but I just want to show you the kinds of questions. Give four characteristics of the upper limb that humans share with other primates. So guys, what are we going to do? We're going to go things we have in common. All right, now remember, you've got to go back to that little picture that we had, upper limb. So only the arm. So what would you talk about here? The shoulder joint, the opposable thumb. All right, what else have we got? All right, our shoulder joint, opposable thumb, shorter arms. All right, and our nails. Okay, there we go. Those would be the four things that you would come up with. Okay, guys, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. We're going to go to a small break and we'll be right back.
Welcome back Life Sciences. That break is always so necessary. We need to get all the body parts going. We need to get the blood flowing. We need to get the oxygen going because this section, we definitely need it. Okay, so what are we looking at? We're revising human evolution. And we're looking at this concept, right? When we look at evolution, we're looking at what caused this divergence? What caused this change to occur? And in our, in our last um, session, we looked at this whole concept of similarities that we share, but the differences. And this bipedalism, right? Bipedalism, being able to walk upright, brought in a whole dimension, right? When it comes to human evolution, the hominins, right? Bipedalism was kind of like that whole speciation event, right? That bring, brought in the whole hominins, living, all right? Us and our living ancestors. Now, when we're looking at the bipedalism, very much as in the last um, session, we need to look at right, the, the skeleton was so important. The differences, because bipedalism brought in this whole difference, right? The trends, this, the cranium getting bigger, right? The teeth smaller. Why? The food, right? What happened to our fingers? Our fingers are getting a little bit longer, but they can grasp our feet right, changing for walking, not gripping, right, and the whole skeleton undergoes a slight change, it's a tweak, right, we don't go kind of like from, right, a skeleton into a unicorn, right, we just kind of make all these little changes along the way. Now, the next section that we have to look at, you need to, right, be able to give examples, right, of fossils that we have seen along the way, a little bit of their characteristics, but not too much of that. Right? What I would suggest you do as a study method is to actually make a table to like, you know, make a little mind map that makes it best. So let's have a look what we mean by that. All right, guys, this picture in front of me is a version that you need to become quite familiar with. Now, when we're looking at the, the evolution, very often when you look at evolution, I think Charles Darwin would have also said it, it's about this tree of life. And here, this is the reason why I've given this diagram. What is a tree about? A tree has a tree trunk that the whole tree has in common. And then what happens to the tree trunk? All these branches branch off of it, All right? You see. This branch might not have anything to do with that branch, yet it's all part of this tree. They all play a role, right? They all play a role, but they might have different roles. Now, what we're looking at when we look at hominin evolution, remember that's what we're looking at, hominins, us and our living ancestors, there were different phases that they went through. We see different kinds of, now look here, we find different kinds of genuses. Because remember, we like to classify things and put things into, into perspective. Now, when we look at this tree, you're going to notice what happens is that some parts of the tree is just going to stop. Now, what do we mean by that happening? That means that that particular species is no longer around. And if we look at this tree, the only one right out of the hominin evolution that is around today is us, the Homo sapiens. Okay, so guys, what are we looking at when we look at the major phases? You don't need to learn everything off by heart here. Yeah. Oh, what is this and what is this? But you do have to understand the basic concepts. So, what we have here is we have, remember, our common ancestors. These guys are always going to be, right, your early hominins. And you'll notice they kind of like don't go anywhere because they, they don't play a direct role as to where the, the humans come in. So what we find over here are these different genuses. And the ones that we pay, right, a lot more attention to of these over here and it's a word that I sometimes myself right get confused with and those are the Australopithecuses. 
Now, basically, if you were put them onto a scale, you would have gorilla as your most primitive and human, right, as your most complex. And these guys kind of fit somewhere in between. Right? When it comes to evolution, the one thing we must really understand is that it's not a direct link, right? We're lucky if we see a direct link. It's these, these branches that just occur. And if you look at the timeline, a lot of the species were actually alive at the same time, right? Different of these ancestors of the hominids. Okay, so you guys need to, right, the ones that you need to be aware of is the Australopithecus afarensis. You need to know examples, Australopithecus africanus, right, and Australopithecus sediba, these ones. And the reason why <laughs> we usually need to know them, because guess what, guys, most of these have been found in, so these fossils were found in South Africa, here in the cradle of humankind. Right, so these guys were our kind of like more ape-like um, characteristics, but we did start to see bipedalism. We see that in their skulls and their structures, right, and they form part of that group. The next group that we look at are the homos, all right? Homo means the same as. Homo also means intelligent. It's the same thing as an orange could be a fruit and an orange could be a color. And the homos that you need to be aware of here are Homo habilis, because this guy, all right, was one of the first found, and he was also the first tool maker. You often are going to, all right, hear about the Homo neanderthalus, the Neanderthals, Homo erectus, those are going to come about when we look at the out of Africa hypothesis. And the Homo naledi, again, they were found in those beautiful rising star caves there at the, at the Maruping, Malapa caves. So South Africa has a really good all right, connection over here. As I said, you need to be able to know these guys, given examples, maybe who the archaeologist was or the anthropologist or right, that founded it, where was it found. So there is a little bit of theory learning that you need to have there, but usually they're going to spell it for you, so you don't always have to learn the spelling. Okay, so guys, very often what's the kind of question they're going to be asked here? They're going to give you a chart. They're going to give you, all right, these kind of diagrams, and you're going to have to, all right, be able to read from it. The table shows the evolution of cranial capacity. Remember what I said, cranial capacity, the cranium, that houses the brain. We never speak about the brain, we speak about the skeleton. Okay, so guys, here we've got a few species, right, that it's telling us, it's giving us a year, and it's telling us the size of the cranial capacity. Remember, the larger the cranial capacity, the larger the brain. Okay, so first question, name to Hominid genre. That's another word for the genus. Now, if we have a look at hominid, right, the hominid basically began, if you guys want to look at it, at the Australopithecus and the Homos. So the two hominid all right, genre over here, over there, that is the genus, and that is the genus over there. Okay. So I'm going to say Homo, and I'm just going to write A because it's a lot to write, and there you've got that. Those are the two. And you're wondering about this one, and are we going to come back to it just now? Okay, I want you to have a look at the time period. doesn't fit into when the speciation. Now, two fossils of Australopithecus africanus. Now, guys... You're going to have to remember over here, there are Africanus and there are Afarensis. Now, the Africanus ones, there are three that you could choose from. As I said, and they were all found here in South Africa. They are the Taung child. Okay, they are Littlefoot. Right, those are the two that were found here 
in South Africa. There's also Lucy, but she was unfortunately found up in Ethiopia. So you cannot use her as an example. So this is your study part. Okay, question number C. The genus that first appeared on Earth. Right, now it's the only one that has a genus. Remember, how do I know it's a genus? Because it always has a capital letter. How do I know it first appeared? Because it tells me, all right, that it was seven, all right, to six million years ago. So I'm going to write it here, short, long word. Salanthropus. All right, so guys, you see, you won't have to learn these things. I'll give you the table and you'll need to give us the information. Which hominid has the cranial capacity closest to that of Homo sapiens? So we have a look. Here's the Homo sapiens, 1450. We simply mean which one is right slightly smaller than ours because we've got the biggest and it asks you for the hominid, and your answer will then be, all right, this one. Homo neanderthalensis. Not neanderthal, neanderthal. Funny enough, we call it a thal, right? Not a thal, an all English language out the window there. So guys, there we go. This has got, now have a look here. Homo sapiens, closest to the Homo sapiens. Did you notice over here, they've got bigger brains than ours, right? They actually were much bigger. But when it came into, to intelligence, funny enough, not so much. Okay, give the smallest cranial capacity, right? And it does tell you of a homo species. So we look, those are out. So we look at these. And the smallest is going to be the homo habilis. And the answer then is going to be now 650, right? And they asked you for the cubic centimeters. So there's your answer. Nice answer over there. Right, then another question. When did Astropolithecus africanus become extinct? So extinct is when they, 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 their species kind of died out. Now this is sometimes a bit of a difficult one to read. All right, so we're looking at this set of information. So guys, you can't tell me, all right, this is period of existence. This is three to two million years ago. So you can't tell me that they, all right, became extinct three million years ago. They were still here, two million. You look at the last one, right? And we go two, and you can write out million years ago, but you can also do that. Okay, guys, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be right back. Welcome back, Life Sciences, that all-important break. Get all the oxygen flowing, get the brain working. This section, as I said, you really, really need it. We're revising evolution of humankind, human evolution. And we've been looking at difficult concepts, yes, all right? So we're looking at this whole, when we look at evolution, how is it, what, what caused this branch, right, from we in the primates, this hominidae, we, 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 we all part of the great apes, but around about six million years ago, this branch occurred, right? This branch, and what, what did we see? What are the trends that there? And we looked at the whole differences, this bipedalism that brought in. What does it bring with it, okay? Walking upright, being able to, right, not walk on all fours. We looked at the trends as far as the skeleton, we, you need to understand how tools come into play, how culture comes into play. And then we looked at the different phases, right, of hominin evolution. We looked at Australopithecans, right, what kind of examples do they have? They, they're more ape-like structures, right, and, but yet they were able to walk upright. Then we looked at the whole genus of the Homo, 
right? What are we starting to see? The trends there, all of that show the trends, the bigger cranium, right? We start to see more sophisticated tools. We start to see the jaw starting to get smaller. The diet has changed. Why has the diet changed? We can link it to culture, to fire, right? To finding food, etc. And the last piece of evidence that we look at is going to be genetic evidence. And that's going to be found right, in the DNA, but most importantly, in the mitochondrial DNA. Now, how the next section that we're going to look at is called the Out of Africa Hypothesis. And there has been a lot of debate over time about where did Homo sapiens start? All right, the Homo sapiens, humans, us. Where did we first originate? And we're going to look this theory, what do we go back to? We go and look at hard evidence. What do the fossils tell us? All right. What does archaeology tell us? Right. What does culture tell us? And most importantly, what do genetics tell us? And if we look at all of those concepts, it basically boils down to the out of Africa, right? And what does that mean? Literally, Homo sapiens originated in Africa and then moved out of Africa. Now, when we come to this hypothesis, right, I want to explain to you what this journey basically is. Now, when we look about why we wanted to move out of Africa, is that Africa at the time used to be quite nice and right dry. Um, there were a little bit, there was actually a lot. It was actually more wetter, it was cooler, there was lots of food, etc. And what happened over time is that Africa as we know it, it became hotter and became drier and there became less food available. And what that meant was people or organ, right, Homo sapiens living or Homo, the group Homo, living in Africa needed to go out of Africa in search of food. Now, I want to explain to you, it's quite, it's quite a, all right, an intricate thing, but basically what happened is, is that if we have a look at all right, Africa over here, the first ones to actually move were Homo erectus because they are older than the Homo sapiens. So we're going to find almost like a wave Homo erectus moved out of Africa, as you can see, it's the yellow, into, all right, the northern continents. And as I said to you, all right, it, it's because of the search of food. And remember, it's getting colder, but what can we do now? We can control fire. If I've got fire, I have got heat. Now, also one thing often you guys forget, this is a flat picture that we're telling you about. What is the earth? It's round. Guys, it connects. So you're going to say, oh, but man, how did they swim across the ocean? They didn't really have to. They could have walked across. Because if I go up, if I join everything, you can actually, the continents, yes, it's really cold and it's really difficult, but it is doable. We always keep on thinking that the earth is flat. It's not. Let's join it. When I look at something round, it becomes a lot more all right, doable. So Homo erectus went out first. And what they often tend to, all right, is that in here, in the northern continents, that's where Homo neanderthalis. You won't see any very little neanderthal genes in Africa. But as we looked at that whole tree, the second wave, all right, was Homo sapiens. Genetic evidence tells us that the oldest Homo sapien fossils are here in Africa, in South Africa, all right, in some of our caves along the coast. Oldest artifacts right, and genetic evidence, mitochondrial DNA, mitochondrial Eve, as she's called. All of it points to the fact that the Homo sapiens, all right, originated in Africa and they then went, followed in a second wave. Right, and basically what happens is they out-competed. They, there are some things that they interbred, but basically at the end, the Homo sapiens, us, we are the only ones that survived. And that is the out-of-Africa hypothesis. As I said, mitochondrial DNA, 
mitochondrial Eve, Africa. The fossils, the oldest Homo sapien fossils here in Africa. All right, so that shows us the theory of what we say that the out of Africa, that Homo sapiens, right, originated here. Okay, what kind of questions can we ask here? Have a look here, it gets to our phylo phylogenetic tree. So guys, very often these are the kind of diagrams that you are going to get, right? Can you uh, read from these phylogenetic trees? It says here, fossil evidence, right, for humans may be interpreted in different ways. One possible model of human evolution is shown below, okay? Tells us a time and it's telling us, it gives you an idea of the history, right? basically who came before who? So what kind of questions are they going to ask us? Name the family, right, to which all the represented diagrams belong. Guys, this is the one that we said right from the beginning. What's the two things I need to know? I need to know that the order is primate and the family that I belong to. Right, it doesn't show us here, but you, unfortunately you do need to know that it's going to be what? The hominid. All right, the hominids, the dids, not the hominins, the hominids. All right, so that's where we're going to go there. There's two families, hominids and the hominins. Now if you have a look here, all right, I'm looking at it again, and if I look at what I can see, I can only see human ancestors. So I'm not going to be part of the super family. Right, here we go. This is the hominins. That would be more correct because I don't see any kind of ape-like creature over there. So hominins would be my answer. Describe how cultural evidence, right, is used to support the theory of human evolution. Now it's for two marks. What is cultural evidence? The first one is tools. What do tools show us? Okay, tools show us the more complex the tool, probably, what else? The larger the cranium size. Right, what else is culture about? Culture also tells us language. What else? Um, culture, another thing would be not only tools, sometimes you guys learnt about jewellery. All of that is culture. And what does that mean? Language, once again, all of that leads to a larger and more complex cranium. Be careful what you say, guys, about intelligence. Okay, so don't link the cranium and brain size. So here we're looking at the human evolution. We, yes, we spoke about the brain size, but we, we, we literally, we made it about the cranium. The larger the cranium, yes, the larger the brain, the larger the brain, the more intelligent we would be. Okay, how long ago did the most recent common ancestor, these are always quite tricky, the most recent common ancestor of Homo erectus, so where we go, we've got to find Homo erectus over here, right, and Homo hub, huddleberg genesis. Now we need to find their common. So we, what do they have in common? So let's take the arrows and there we go. Where do they link to? The Australopithecus afarensis, the most common right, ancestor they're going to be there. Okay, guys, not an easy section, and I know it's not always your favorite one, but you do have to have that understanding of it. All right, to be it, go, past, go over past papers, go and find resources, make yourself simple little mind maps to to just bring it down a bit to a concept that you are going to be, under, to be able to understand. I'm afraid that is all that we have time for. Until next time, cherry bye.